With College Board discontinuing practice exams one through three, we have a pretty good idea of what will and will not be on the upcoming exam. Here are some question types you can expect to encounter on the March SAT. First up, we've got words and context questions where you replace a word. And the key here is that when you're replacing a word, these passages tend to be quite old. So you need to keep in mind that the most common definition you're used to is most likely not going to be the correct answer. In fact, it's going to be a distractor answer. So in this question, for example, when we think of entertain, I think of, you know, providing amusement. A good way to avoid falling into the trap of choosing the most common definition is to ignore the word and just fill in the blank. So if I'm looking at my context here, we have the notion pressed upon him unpleasantly, yet he could not wholly refuse to blank the possibility it contained vital news. My prediction here would be something like think about, could not re wholly refuse, but think about the possibility that it might contain vital news. Then when I go to eliminate, provide amusement is probably the most common definition for entertain, and it's not the right answer. Consider lines up with think about, I would keep that. Host is another common definition for entertain, not my answer. Enjoy doesn't fit the bill, so my answer is B, consider. Next up, we have rhetorical synthesis summaries. So if you've watched some of my videos, you probably know that my first step for these types of questions is to ignore the notes. We are only going to read them if we have to, which is rarely the case. After that, we want to focus on the goal. The goal in this case is the student wants to summarize the study. Seems simple enough, but we need to consider what are we looking for in a summary? So before we go through to eliminate, a summary of a study is going to tell us very briefly who conducted the study, why the study was conducted, and the results of the study. So choice A, we get the study, we get researchers in Antarctica, we get that they're observing penguins. What we don't get is a result. Since we're missing a result, I'm gonna get rid of A. B, we get the researchers. This time we actually get a name, so even better than just researchers in Antarctica, I would say. We get what they wanted to know, and we get that they conducted a study, but again, we do not have the result. B is out. C, understanding that penguins faced challenges, researchers measured the success rate, which dropped to 30% under extreme conditions. So this one, it seems like we get the result, but this is a very specific detail. We're looking for a more holistic view of the result. And looking at choice D, we get Dr. Wendy Frost. That name is better than just researchers. We get the year of the study. We get what the study was doing. And we get the success rate of foraging attempts decreased as ocean temperatures rose. So that is the actual result. Our answer is choice D. I'm also predicting that you are going to run into sciency texts, specifically sciency command of evidence texts. You're going to know that you're dealing with one of these if you run into, first of all, a bunch of sciency jargon in your passage, but also the question is going to say, which would most directly support or weaken some sort of a claim or hypothesis. The good news is with these, we do not need to know what the words mean. We just need to logically fit the pieces together. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So first thing you want to do is actually find the claim, which tends to be toward the end. And indeed, I see claim. So after this, we get stabilizing flibonites using pulsar-mediated PMOFs enhances their durability and makes them more efficient in quarkian energy conversion. So the key is to focus on the words that you do understand and come up with your own caveman version of the claim based on that. So I see using, I understand using, and we know that the thing that they're using is abbreviated as PMOFs. Enhances durability. That is something I understand. It means it makes them stronger and makes them more efficient in energy conversion. So I'm going to just focus on these right here, and I'm going to restate the claim as PMOF make stronger and more efficient. And from here, I'm going to actually start eliminating. Choice A says, Flibonites treated with PMOFs maintained their crystalline integrity when exposed to high QFV levels. So maintaining integrity 
would be a signal that they are stronger, while untreated flibonites, so not treated with these PMOFs, showed significant degradation under the same conditions. That fits with makes stronger. We don't necessarily have anything about more efficient there, but let's hold on to A. B, when subjected to low QFV environments, both the PMOF treated and untreated flibonites displayed identical energy conversion rates. So this is mentioning the PMOFs, but it's saying there was no change in conversion rates and structural stability. So stronger, more efficient. There is supposed to be a difference, so I'm going to get rid of B. PMOF-treated flibonites were found to contain subatomic patterns consistent with quark realignment, a phenomenon theorized to enhance energy amplification in quarkian systems. Whoa! So what language do I understand? Well, we have the PMOF-treated flibonites. We know that we're supposed to look for these. And we have, there's a theory about energy amplification. So maybe that would go with the energy conversion, but it doesn't quite seem more efficient. And then the biggest issue here is it doesn't compare these to the untreated flibonites. We would need a comparison in order to say that they're actually stronger. Uh, so... For that reason alone, uh, not to mention that the language doesn't line up, I'm getting rid of C. B, untreated flibs were more likely to display irregular crystalline fractures after repeated exposure compared to PMOF-treated flibs. This one also seems to be comparing the untreated to the uh, treated ones, and it seems like it's saying they're stronger. However, if we look at the language here, it says irregular crystalline fractures. The word irregular is making this answer not quite as strong because it's not saying that they were more likely to display fractures, fractures being some sort of a break, which would mean they're not as strong, but it says irregular fractures. So if the fractures you know, just aren't quite as uniform, that doesn't necessarily matter because it doesn't tell us that they were actually not as strong. So I'll get rid of B, and our answer is going to be choice A. If that last question seemed challenging, chances are you need to brush up on your reading comprehension skills. And I actually just released my reading course for the SAT. Go ahead and use the link in the description to get a nice big discount on that reading course. Now, the first type of math question I want you to look out for are these sneaky, sneaky math questions that tend to show up at the beginning of the second module, provided you've gotten to the harder math module. And I call them sneaky because it looks pretty simple and it looks like we could actually just get away with eyeballing this. We know that we wanna go to where x equals five and we can just kinda like draw a straight line up and like right here, it's looking like it's pretty much just five and a half, right? So what is five and a half? Uh, that would be 11 over two. That's my answer, yeah? But this is a mistake. You really do want to take the two points that they gave you and figure out what your slope is and then kind of go from there. So we have nine and we have 13. The slope is going down. So we know our slope is negative nine over 13. And in fact, we know our equation is going to be y equals negative 9 over 13x plus 9, because that's our y-intercept as well, right? So from here, we actually need to plug in 5 for x, and we get y equals negative 9 over 13 times 5 plus 9, and all of this ends up simplifying to... 72 over 13, which is choice C. Next up, we've got simply perpendicular lines. And for perpendicular lines, we just need to remember that the slopes are the opposite and they are the reciprocal. So here, if we were to turn this into slope intercept form, we know that that 13x is going to move over to the right side. We would subtract it. We'd have 3y equals negative 13x plus 37. And then this whole thing is going to have to get divided by 3 to get y by itself, right? So then our slope ends up being negative 13 over 3. So what is the opposite inverse of that? Well, instead of negative, it would be positive. And instead of 13 over 3, it would be 3 over 13. So we're looking for 3 over 13, which is choice A. 
All right, last up, we've got product of the solutions to either a polynomial or usually a quadratic. In this case, we have a polynomial. But the cool thing is, if our polynomial is in factored form like this is, it's going to be the same exact shortcut as if we're dealing with just a quadratic. So our formula for factored form for a quadratic would normally be y equals a times x minus p times x minus q. The product of the solutions is just p times q, because p and q are the solutions. The one thing you need to look out for is that because it's minus p and minus q, whatever those numbers are, they're going to have their sign flipped. We can do the same thing here. We just have to multiply negative 9 times 3 times negative 4. This is going to end up being positive 108. But remember, because it's minus p and minus q, we follow that same rule with any polynomial. So this will get flipped to negative 108. Our answer is choice C. And then if we are in standard form, there's another shortcut. Standard form would be y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And here, our shortcut is going to be c divided by a. That's going to be the product of our solutions. Now, this up here looks absolutely crazy. It's crazy! But the good news is, all of this stuff in parentheses is actually just b because it's being multiplied by x. It's the coefficient for x. So we can ignore it. We don't care about that. All we care about is c, which is going to be ab in this case, divided by a, which is 11 in this case. And then it's telling us the product of the solutions, which is ab over 11, is rab. So this is equal to rab. Those are my initials, by the way. Very cool. And then it says r is a constant. What is the value of r? Well, we just have to simplify and solve for r. We can get rid of a, b because it's in the numerator of both of these. So then we're left with 1 over 11 because there was an invisible 1 in front of the a, b, right? Anything times 1 is itself. So our answer is 1 over 11, which is choice b. Knowing what questions you're going to encounter is helpful, but you still need to practice. Right now, I'm actually offering free access to my SAT Success Studio. The free version of this program is going to give you access to a mini exam, a full practice exam, and around 500 practice questions. What's really cool is you get to work through these questions using an interface that mimics Blue Book. So you're practicing under the same conditions of the actual exam that you'll be taking. To sign up, just go ahead and use the link in the description next to SAT Success Studio.